And we are live. Welcome to Guy Aitchison's Reinventing the Tattoo, where tattooers, apprentices, collectors, and the curious come to learn about and share uh, about tattooing and art. And uh, today is a very special show. We've got a prehistory with Aaron, a real academic who's been studying ancient tattoos. And uh, uh, Ginger and Guy Aitchison are here to help uh, do some interviewing and, and find out about some of this history. Thank you very much for dealing with some of our technical delays. The internet was wonky, but it seems to be we've sacrificed enough to the internet gods. So if you are watching this on like Facebook or somewhere semi-random, you always want to make sure you go to get the latest and greatest events from reinventing. Uh, and either of the app stores, either the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, you can download uh, Reinventing the Tattoo. And then the events link is the first one. We are streaming out uh, over five times a week with awesome, inspirational quality uh, tattoo content. So let's uh, get kind of right into it. I want to thank our sponsors real quick, uh, inkjetstencils.com. You can treat your tattoo reference right there on your iPad or on your computer and then print it out from your eco-friendly or eco-tank Epson printer and print out your stencils. It saves your hands, saves you time, saves you a little bit of money. And if you are doing back pieces, you can get an oversized printer and uh, print out back pieces and sleeves in one shot. Uh, Loose Screw Tattoo in Richmond, Virginia is a, a great tattoo shop led by Jesse Smith. Very entrepreneurial. He's got a great team of people there to learn from. And it's a wicked busy shop. So if you are doing, you know, uh, great tat uh, tattoos, great black and gray tattoos, color tattoos, and are ready to be professional, uh, give them a shot. Uh, LooseScrewTattoo.com. There's a link up there that says join. Let them know that you're constantly learning and that you found out about them through reinventing the tattoo. They'll know you're on the same wavelength. Um, RawPigments.co is an ink company uh, based out of California, I believe. They are uh, getting their inks uh, uh, and their pigments straight from the source. Uh, check it out. There's... Um, we, uh, uh, Lauren hosted a business call. It's in the uh, library in the uh, on the app, and you can check it out. It's the uh, uh, reinventing the tattoo business conference call, and it was uh, it was awesome. There's like twenty or thirty different uh, companies on board there, and uh, including raw pigments. In any event, uh, let me get into the background and pass this off to the guy and Ginger to interview Aaron. Uh, this is going to be very exciting. Um, All right. Hey, thank you, Gabe. And thanks everyone for tuning in and uh, for dealing with our, our delays earlier. Um, Zoom was not being friendly with us. But uh, anyway, today we've got with us Mr. Aaron Dieter Wolf, who is uh, a real anthropologist. And, and this is exciting because, you know, I remember, you know, early in my career, one of my regular clients was uh, this guy who owned a, a bookstore and uh, was obsessively collecting, you know, any article and book he could find on the subject of, of an early man and how they. Uh, you know, marked and tattooed each other. And uh, uh, so it's, it's always been a subject that, uh, you know, of course, we, we all know about Atsi the Iceman, but, you know, it goes much deeper than that. And, you know, we hear about how tattooing is among, among the most ancient art forms, but it's always great to hear some science about it. We've also got uh, Ginger Smith here with us. Uh, hi, Ginger. Hi. And She's part of the Reinventing the Tattoo community and uh, has been instrumental in arranging this whole thing. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you found out about Aaron and uh, some of the projects that he's been working on. Um, well, I found out about Aaron through Michael and Kathleen O'Neill Gear. Is that right? Um, they're active anthropologists and they write a um, series of books on ancient um, pre-Columbian Indians that's how they were before we know them as the tribes they are today. Um, so I sent them a message and asked them if they had any advice for um, doing some research into the timeline and they referred me to Aaron. So, and a book, Ancient Ink, which I ended up getting that has his work in it and he edited it. So here we are today. Nice. Aaron, could you uh, uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us uh, how you became interested in this subject. Yeah, well, you know, thank you all for starters for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I, so I'm a professional archaeologist. Um, I work for the Tennessee Division of Archaeology in Nashville, Tennessee. And so most of my work relates to ancient Native American sites in Tennessee. 
um, you know, managing the 26,000 or so archaeological sites we have in the state of Tennessee, and then also doing uh, research on um, archaeological topics. And uh, I myself am tattooed and you know, this, most archaeologists I know are tattooed. And this was actually sort of something that we sort of, I sort of came to over the years and sort of these lunchtime conversations with other archaeologists, you know, sitting around the shaker screens, eating lunch, comparing tattoos. A lot of archaeologists have tattoos of ancient art, um, you know, pictographs and things like this. And sort of collectively, we came to this, this realization in talking about these things that you know, all of us were tattooed and we were fairly confident that people were tattooed in the, in the distant past as well, but that there seemed to be very little archaeology or academic research looking into this. And this was, you know, in the late 90s through early part of the 2000s. Um, and at the time, there really wasn't anybody talking about this. And, you know, Guy, you're talking about the, the, the fellow who you knew who was always collecting these images of or sources about people marking their bodies in the past. And, you know, that's a thing that we know that, that people have decorated their bodies literally as long as humans have been human, right? So for at least, at least 100,000 years, humans have been decorating their bodies. But, you know, I, after I got out of college and when I was going through grad school, I felt like there was this, this real absence of credible scientific discussions of that sort of thing. So you can find all over the place on the internet or um, places where people have sort of, you know, said offhand, oh, well, you know, this ancient statue has some marks carved on it and those might be tattoos, but that's about as far as it goes. And that information is out there in a lot of cases. And there's a lot more that we can learn by reanalyzing the information that's been found before by looking at, um, tools and technologies with new technologies, with new eyes, and, you know, sort of shedding, I think, a lot of the tattoo biases of the past. Um, you know, traditional academia is not particularly enamored with tattooing in much the same way that, you know, American culture hasn't been um, very approving of the practice up until recently. And so this has sort of been the thrust of my research then over the last decade or so is, has been trying to figure out what are we missing about this practice archaeologically and, and what are some ways that we can reevaluate what we think we know and, and maybe learn entirely new information from it. And so along the way, that's um, focused mainly on tools. Uh, most of my research is about ancient tattooing tools. And then recently, I've also segued into um, work on uh, ancient mummies. So looking at uh, particularly pre-Columbian mummies from South America and trying to look at ways to document the tattoos on those mummies using new technologies, using things like uh, infrared imaging or uh, image decorrelation software. And so I think we'll probably talk a little bit about that along the way. Yeah, I guess that's what, definitely one of the interesting questions is how do you disentangle, you know, all this all the noise and find the information. For example, you were talking about statues that might have markings carved on them. Like how is it that you would be able to conclude from that if this was just an artistic flourish or if uh, people would actually be wearing these, these very same markings? Well, yeah, I see what you mean there. It's very, because we see these kinds of tattoos on, uh, you know, I mean, this has got a little bit of hint of Maori, a little bit hint of, uh, uh, some African tribal scarification, just the movements and, and uh, placement of that. It looks kind of familiar. Yeah, so this is a, this is a effigy head pot. So it's a ceramic vessel. Um, it's from an ancient Native American site in Arkansas. Dates to about uh, the 1200s, 1250 or so there AD. And this is a great example of that. You know, you see body modification here. Um, other versions, other vessels that are in the same canon of art have what may be filed teeth. You see, obviously, the pierced earlobes, and then you see these incised designs on the face. Um, there's this sort of burst coming out from beside the mouth. It's a little hard to see, but that's actually a bird that's wings are wrapped around the eye. So the wings mm -hmm. are wrapping around the top and bottom and the bird's head is pointing towards the corner of the eye. And then on the opposite side, there's this, this complex pattern of incising. And so, you know, you're hitting a dead on guy, right? You see something like this and you say, well, 
how do we know that this is a depiction of ancient tattooing as opposed to say body painting or you know something completely different like this may be a depiction of not even a real human of a of a god or a preternatural figure in which case you know how do we talk about body modification for beings that don't really exist in our physical world and so there's all of these questions that come out of that best case scenario we can connect ancient art with historic practices and so in the case of that particular vessel there are some really interesting portraits painted from life of tattooed Native Americans from the uh, 16 and 17 and 1800s from the same general region where that vessel was excavated. And those portraits bear some of the same or very similar marks to what we see on that effigy vessel. And so that's a way to directly connect those practices then and say, you know, within a certain degree of tolerance that this is not um, probably a temporary thing, but instead is actually tattooing. So this, this portrait we're looking at right now, uh, was this based on a description from early explorers that was brought back to an artist? Is it like kind of a third hand depiction like that or? Yeah, uh, you know, like you said, you said the word disentangling and I think that's a great that's a great way to look at it. Um, if you guys actually can back up uh, two pictures there. Um, so what you've got here is, is one of John White's portraits of a tattooed Algonquin woman from the Carolina and Virginia coast in I think the early 1500s. Um, and these portraits that John White painted have been reproduced widely by, uh, in various different forms, but they've also been adapted and they've been created not just as watercolors, but as etchings and in other forms of art. Some of them have been hand colored. And as, those re as that reproduction process takes place, you lose some details and other details are added. Um, you know, artists who have never, who'd never actually traveled to the new world, uh, European artists who'd never seen a Native American in life created these images of what they thought were tattooed Native Americans. And, you know, 500 years later, a thousand years later, to us, we see these images as being historical fact, quote unquote fact, because they're very old and they come from an authoritative source. But one of the key issues in looking at or talking about the past is trying to understand what, what is true and what is true-ish and what are the biases of the people that were creating these images, right? Okay, so John White creates these images of tattooed Native Americans. Well, so jump down. Yeah, here's a detail of that. And if you jump down to the next image um, of the blue lady. So in his same folio, in that same folio of watercolors, he includes this image. And this is an image of what he was saying the decorated ancient pics of Britain and Scotland looked like. Now, this, this series, again, this series of... Um, his images of these blue painted, plausibly tattooed, although the marks are shown in red and other colors, these ancient pics have been reproduced widely as being you know, factual representations of what ancient British body art looked like. But you know, John White lived a thousand years after the last person that would call himself an Iron Age pick, right? He was, he was an artist, he wasn't a scholar, he wasn't a historian, he didn't have any specific special knowledge. When he made this image, what he was doing is he was juxtaposing the images of tattooed Native Americans that he had seen in life with the ancient history of his readership, of the people in England, and this idea that they were, were familiar with, that people in their past had decorated their bodies the same way. So, you know, his intent here wasn't to show a literal depiction of ancient Pictish body art, but was to connect with his readership. And so that's that sort of disentangling that, you know, you've got to be aware of what your source is and what his intent was when he made this image. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's gotta be a, a, a real filtering process. Uh, now, if you don't mind me asking uh, kind of a layman's question here, uh, the difference between anthropology and archeology span and then where these two practices intersect uh, you know, I've always thought that the study of ancient humans was anthropology and the study of the artifacts, I guess, would be, uh, 
the archaeology, but I know that that's a very oversimplified definition. No, you, you're close to there, right? So, you know, anthropology generally is the study of people. And under the blanket of anthropology, there are a lot of sort of sub disciplines. Um, here in, in North America, in your average university anthropology department, you'll find uh, archaeology, cultural anthropology. So that's archaeology being the study of ancient people, cultural anthropology, the study of living people, linguistics, how people speak, and uh, biological anthropology, you know, humans as biological creatures. And, you know, you could, you could then blow that out even more and include things like forensic anthropology, right? The, thing that, the things that, uh, um, you know, you see on TV that police forces are using to solve crimes. You know, there are all of these different things that all feed into the study of, of humans and who, who, who we were, who we are, where we're going, you know, all of these topics. And so as an archaeologist, I work with the material remains of the past. And most often that is artifacts, right? It is the things that people have thrown away or left behind or buried in the earth, their buildings, their tools, their toys, their jewelry. But we also then work with their bodies themselves. You know, as people have died and become part of the archeological record, they then themselves become artifacts. You know, think of your body, everything you've, every bone you've ever broken, uh, the, the, the drinking water that you drink, um, you know, how your bones are formed, all of that sort of becomes an artifact of your life. And so all of that then can fall under the, uh, the study of archaeology. Okay, so while, while we're talking about this kind of larger, big picture, uh, Ginger, you've been uh, working on filling in the timeline uh, for the, the tattoo history kind of broad brush. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what you found so far? What is, what is our earliest known tattoo artifact? Um, the earliest known tattoo artifact was found in 2018 recently, um, a cactus spine in Utah. And Aaron, didn't you say that you were involved in the identification of that? Yeah, I was. Yeah, that was, um, you know, again, artifacts are, uh, it's, it's tricky and you hate to Monday morning quarterback your colleagues, right? But like, you know, going back to the early 1900s, people have been pulling sharp bones, for example, out of the archaeological record and sort of waving them around and saying this was used as a tattoo tool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there are things that have been identified as tattooing tools from Paleolithic cave sites in France, right? Sites that date back 15 or 20,000 years before present. But part of my research then has been trying to look at you know, can we prove that that is a tattooing tool as opposed to a tool that was used to, you know, decorate a clay vessel or, um, you know, pierce hides for making clothing or something like that. And this, this tool that you see here on the screen, um, my colleague, uh, Andrew Gilworth Brown, who's out at uh, Washington State, he was, uh, I'm sorry, University of Washington, um, he was doing research with a old collection from Southern Utah and came across this beautifully preserved tool. Uh, this is from a site that's a, a desert rock shelter or cave site in Southern Utah. The preservation is incredible. There are 2000 year old human hairs that have come out of this archeological site. And you know, that's really unusual. But what this is, is it's, it's a tool made out of a, uh, a skunk bush sumac twig. So the twig of a, of a, of a shrub basically. And it's got two cactus spines, two prickly pear cactus spines that have been shoved into the pith, into the center of that twig. And then the end has been wrapped with yucca fiber. And what drew Andrew's attention to it is the fact that the tips of the cactus spines are black, not anywhere else on the object, just the very tips. And so this was a project that then um, he brought me in on and we worked with a couple other fantastic researchers to try to get into the real nitty gritty of this artifact and figure out exactly how old it was, what it was made up of, what all these different constituent parts were, and to see if we could prove that it was used for tattooing as opposed to any other purpose. And ultimately what we did is we ended up doing a, uh, a series of what we call experimental archeology, span which is where you, you recreate and use tools and then learn about them from that experience. And so, um, Andrew created 
a series of replicas using the same plants, modern examples of these same plants, and use them to tattoo pig skin repeatedly. And then using very high powered microscopes, he took images of these tools before and during and after the tattooing process. And, and ultimately what we learned was that um, the process of tattooing leaves a really distinctive microscopic wear signature on the tips. So as these cactus spines are jammed into human skin or, or pig skin over and over and over again, it creates a, a, a discernible, a, a replicable pattern. And we could identify that same pattern on that tool that you were showing. And so what this is then is that that means we were able to show that that tool is the, the oldest tattooing tool from North America. And it's from the first hundred years or so AD. Um, these pictures that you're showing now are of bone tools. So this is a similar experiment done with bone tools. And this shows them again under a scanning electron microscope before it was used to tattoo and then after it was used to tattoo. And you can see how the tip of that artifact has changed. And that's after only about 200 punctures into skin. And so you start to get, you sort of get an idea of the, the fact that, you know, as tools were used for specific things, they change in ways that we can then identify. And that's, that's been a big part of this research is trying to then um, look back at collections and say, well, this, this pointed object that was found somewhere else that might've been for any number of purposes, well, based on these microscopic patterns that are formed on the surface, we can say it was used for tattooing. So this is a video of, of experimental tattooing with one of those cactus spine tools. And uh, you know, most people that I show it to, tattooists included, are like, oh my God, that's way too deep. Um, but this is actually a really, really closely zoomed image. That blob of pigment on the spines, that's only about two millimeters up the end of the spine. So that gives you an idea of how closely zoomed in we are here. Right, that's, that's about about where we would be putting it in that two, two and a half millimeter. I can tell by the size of the fingers in the background. Uh, yeah, it just, it looks a little bit, you know, if you don't take a careful look at the size of those fingers, it does look a little bit scary, but uh, yeah. you know, keeping in mind that these are cactus spines, just for, yes. for scale, which are very small. Uh, and so those tools aren't nearly as blunt as they appear either. No, and one of the interesting things we found in that experiment is, um, you know, cactus spines are covered with these tiny microscopic barbs. It's why they're really hard to get out of your skin if you just accidentally fall onto one. But during the tattooing process, within about five minutes, all of those barbs strip off. And, you know, that sounds bad when you say it out loud. Um, but, you know, that seems to just be a process and it doesn't actually seem to impact, you know, the healing or the deposition of ink or anything like that. But what it means is that when we looked at that, the artifact from Utah, we could tell under the microscope that all of the barbs had been stripped off to just over two millimeters from their points. And so that, you know, that then lets us see exactly how deep it was going into the skin and sort of gives us, gives us that, you know, comparative value. Okay, so if, if our earliest confirmed tattooing tool in the archeological record is 2000 years, Ginger, uh, do you uh, know off the top of your head the oldest uh, mummified tattoo exam. The oldest mummified mummified tattoo person is Atsi. He is so oh my goodness, six thousand years, maybe older. Did I get that right, Aaron? <laughs> you're, you're about fifty two hundred years old. Yeah, mm -hmm. so thirty two hundred BC or thereabout. Oh, so oh, yeah. it's easy to you know assume that he wasn't the first person to get tattooed either uh it's just hard to find any kind of records from before that of course yeah yeah you know there are tattooed mummies from all over the world i think we've got them from maybe 70 sites or so at this point uh, most of those sites are in the andes or in uh, the pacific slope of the andes in peru but really pretty much every continent other than australia has produced at least one tattooed mummy at this point mm. and you know, there's just, there's incredible luck involved in a body going into the archaeological record and the conditions being just right to preserve the tissue. And then for that tissue to be recovered by archaeologists, and then for someone to, in, in many cases, use the right technology to look for it. Um, so, you know, a great example of this is, is the two 
next oldest mummies after Utsi are Egyptian mummies. They're pre-dynastic. They're from a site called Gebelin. These mummies were excavated over a century ago and have been on public display in the British Museum for something like 100 years. And because of the way that their skins darkened in the archaeological record, they were not known to be tattooed. And then uh, Renee Friedman, who, who wrote in a chapter to our book, Ancient Ink, um, she had been finding tattoos on uh, Nubian C group, which is a, so a different culture um, in the up sort of uh, upper Nile Valley. Um, she had been finding tattoos on those mummies. And so she had an infrared camera that she was using to document those. And she went out into the gallery of the British Museum and took these pictures of these pre-dynastic mummies that were on display. And voila, there are tattoos. They've been there all along. It's just no one had looked for them with the right technology. Mm, that's, so that's sort of a, cool. Yeah, that's that's sort of a like there are there there are a bloody ton of mummies out there that haven't been looked at using these technologies yet. And so I think particularly over the next decade, as people are becoming more interested in this, we're going to see this, this surge in the number of tattooed mummies that are known. And I think probably Utsi will lose his crown, right? Sooner or later, they're going to find an older mum. There are older mummies out there. It's just we don't know yet that any of them are tattooed. But I think sooner or later, we will push that date back earlier. Do you know how old the oldest mummy in the human collection is? I think the oldest ones, um, I believe, are from uh, the Chinchoro culture, which is uh, southern, towards the southern tip of South America, um, sort of uh, Peru running into Chile from that desert region. And they go back about, I believe, about 8,000 years before present. Wow. And so, you know, of course, these desert regions are where mummification is going to have a chance to really shine in terms of preservation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It just makes me think of Indiana Jones for some reason. Well, and you just, so you just showed a, a, one of the images of a drawing of some of these tattoos on an Andean mummy. Um, you know, that's a great example where, you know, for 200 years now, people have been seeing visible tattoos on Andean mummies um, you know, travelers and scholars and, you know, people just farming their fields that are discovering these things. But up until now, there's never been any real effort to document or catalog or decipher what those marks are, right? It's always just been kind of almost a sideshow sort of thing, right? Oh, wow, look at the tattooed mummy. And, you know, maybe it gets put in a regional museum, or maybe it's mentioned in a paper that's published, but there's not been any real effort to sort of get into the meat of that, right? What do those tattoos mean? What are they showing us? Are they all on men? Are they all on women? Are they on a combination? You know, there, there are the, all of these questions that we can get at using the data that's already out there. And, you know, to say nothing of what we can learn from, from new discoveries that are going to keep happening. Yeah, I mean, clearly there's some relationship with the fact that uh, modern tattooing has kind of gotten itself out of the ghetto and, and has gotten attention as a legitimate art form. And so, you know, it's kind of a shame that, you know, the, these stigma that, that we've been stuck with for all this time would also filter across into academia where, you know, clearly these tattoos are thousands of years old. They should be of interest, you know, yeah. but because, because modern, you know, pirate tattoos aren't, aren't uh, respectable we're not going to look at Atsi's tattoos either because clearly he must not be respectable either right well so early on in this research um I was uh you know I'd sort of sort of started down this path of trying to look for ancient tattoos and was was talking to um you know Dr. High Muckety Muck at a, at a prestigious academic institution right and uh, you know this old graybeard archaeologist and and was talking with him about you know, trying to find sources for tattooed mummies. And, you know, this, this old graybeard academic, and he sort of waved his hands at me and, you know, dismissively and was like, there are more grad students with tattoos of ancient art than there were ancient peoples who were tattooed. And, you know, like that was his line in the sand. And, he, and he's 100% wrong, right? You know, like we know this, we, you know, we could, have, we, we could have said that at the time at which it happened that he was 100% wrong, but I think you're, you're dead on. There's been this traditional bias 
in mainstream society and and, and that carries into academia for most of the 20th century and and people just weren't really interested in these topics. Um, you know, Utzi, who you see here, is the front and the back view of, of Utzi the Iceman. And every one of those little numbers shows where one of his tattoos was located. Now, his, his tattoos were immediately seen when he, the day he came out of the ice, they saw tattoos on his body. And there's a very early discussion of those tattoos within the first months, maybe, of when he came out, where it's suggested that he must have been a, uh, a robber or a highwayman whose uh -huh. who's, uh, crew turned on him and murdered him and left him in the ice. And the evidence for this was because he was tattooed. And, you know, so I think that that really kind of gets to the heart of the thing, right? It sort of reveals what, what people were saying. Um, and as part of disentangling that we were mentioning before, one of the things I've experienced is that very few of the older generation of academics are themselves tattooed. And so there's a disconnect between the evidence that they see, that one might see, and actual experience of the process or an understanding of the process. And so there have been instances, for example, where people have found um, defleshed bones in the archaeological record that have uh, black carbon designs on them. And they have said, well, this must have been where the tattoo went too deep and marked the leg bone. And, you know, anybody who's ever given a tattoo, I mean, you can think about setting your machines that runs deep enough that it's actually going to, you know, like <laughs> etch it into the leg bone, right? Like that's, and, and then think about doing that same thing, except using like a bone needle or a bronze, you know, a bronze stick and poke <laughs> tool. And it's, you know, it's crazy town. There's no way that's what's going on. And it, you know, it would have been a terrible idea. It wouldn't have healed well, but the people that have been making those identifications didn't under, fundamentally didn't understand how tattooing worked. And so I think that's been a big change in the analysis too, is that there's this new generation of academics and people who are interested in this who are themselves tattooed and part of the tattoo community. Yeah, I, I can also see there being a, a you know, lo looking at, you know, archeology span in the past and just imagining this sort of like, you know, elitist sort of attitude of, I am looking at these, these pitiful ancient cultures here where I can imagine nowadays there's a lot more of a sense of, I wanna get inside the mindset of these people. I wanna understand what it was like to be them. I wanna to relate to them. You know, I wanna be able to know their story from a human level so that, you know, maybe I can, you know, crack some of the puzzle if I try to look at it as a human being and not just as a, uh, this elite authority. Well, exactly. And I think another big part of that connection is um, the recognition of the importance of tattooing historically and among indigenous groups. And, you know, when we start talking about that, you, you, know, you very quickly come to realize and appreciate that, you know, for most of the world, for most of the people that were tattooed over human history, this was not, you know, it was, it was something that was hardwired into their society, right? They were given specific marks that they themselves didn't get to choose. And they were given them when they became adults, or when they accomplish particular feats or, you know, to commemorate the, the things that their ancestors had done or to, you know, literally connect them with spiritual powers. And so once you start looking at it in those terms, yeah, you really realize that, you know, it was probably that fundamentally important to people living in the ancient past as well. And that's something we need to work on deciphering. Right. And of course, nowadays we've got this incredibly complicated culture. And tattooing is, you know, even though it's a major thing to some people, it's just part of this very complicated culture. But imagine, you know, living in a, a much simpler society. You've got your your huts and you've got your uh, your daily things that you have to do, your hunting or whatever. Uh, you're not going to own a whole lot of things. Or maybe the idea of ownership in and of itself is, is just not even a concept. Right. Uh, but then you've got your tattoos. That would actually be a very important, a very visible, a very uh, personal thing. And considering that it is that even now when we have all these other distractions, imagine how important it must have been back then. Yeah. Well, I think you know, people have, I think there's this growing casualness about tattoos as, you know, as they become more and more prevalent in particularly American, but, you know, global society. But, you know, even so, right, like the marks on our bodies 
it's this process of negotiation, right? They show the world who we want to be, what we aspire to be, how we picture ourselves. And as you're saying, you know, if we're talking about like a forager society 5,000 years ago where they have, where they're, they may not even have permanent residences that they're living in, right? They may be moving around the landscape to forage different resources throughout the year. There's not a lot of permanence there. And so something that you can put on your body for the rest of your life or is put on your body for the rest of your life you know, that becomes really, really significant in, in identifying who you are in your group and identifying who you are to new people that you meet who may be from outside the group. So these images you were just showing there are uh, tattoos on the arm of an Andean mummy. That's one of the Andean mummies I've documented. And there's two images there. The first one shows the arm under natural light and you can sort of get an idea of, you know, that there are marks there. And in the second, the next image then is under infrared. And you can see how then, you know, it clarifies those images a little bit. And we can start to see these individual fish and even the individual eyes on the individual fish swimming on the inside of this forearm. Mm. So uh, have there ever been any like strong lines of evidence to conclude what any of these people's tattoos meant or signified beyond just trying to uh, piece it together? It depends on the region. You know, some, yeah. some areas are better than others. Um, in the Andes, like in those, those mummies we were just looking at, those are pre-Inca mummies. And, you know, there are things that happen historically. There are these tides of history. And, and for example, in the Andes, one of the things that happened was as the Inca empire expanded, it seems to have suppressed, we think, individual regional tattooing traditions, right? They wanted to make everybody part of the Inca empire. And part of that was taking away these individual ethnic identities and sort of subsuming them under the guise of the empire. The Romans did exactly the same thing, right? The Han Chinese did exactly the same thing. Um, ancient China is another great example of that. There are, there are groups that tattoo all over what is now China historically. But then as, you know, as the age of empires, as the march of history comes through, those individual traditions are, are suppressed and oppressed and removed and become you know, marks of, I, of I, had a Hungarian, right? I had a Hungarian tattoo artist tell me that that happened in Hungary during uh, uh, post-war, you know, USSR uh, occupation, that they did the exact same thing, just uh, that there was actual a cultural traditional tattooing there but it is gone as far as like modern day is concerned that they have no idea what it was or what it meant. Yeah. Right. And so there are these ruptures through history then. Right. And that makes it really hard to then get back past that break and know why exactly were they tattooing fish on their arms? And so this is where, you know, anthropology comes in because then we can sort of wave our hands and say things like, well, the marine resources off the Pacific coast were critical to their well-being and health and their trade. And, you know, this, they're a maritime society, you know, these sorts of things. But, you know, what that specific fish was or, you know, there may be significance in the numbers of them, the direction that they're facing. And we just we're not there yet where we can get we can get that information. Right. Did he have to earn each one of those fish somehow? You know, yeah. Kind of yeah, exactly. Hmm. You know, it's in some ways it's frustrating to just not be able to know those answers because, you know, I mean, you think about the motivations people have for getting tattooed now and it, there's as many motivations as there are people, right? And it's, certainly there are traditions where you collect something based on earning it, you know, I mean, uh, people in the clean and sober uh, yeah. uh, culture sometimes will collect tattoos based on that or, you know, in bike clubs or, you know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, versus, you know, the individualistic aspect of things, which, you know, obviously here in America or in Western culture in general, uh, it's a lot about, I want to come up with something that's uniquely me. And that's probably a very modern thing. You know, it's hard to imagine a lot of ancient tattooing happening under that premise. It seems like it is, you know, when you look at the broad scope of things, there seems to be a, 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 a tradition of that in uh, Western culture, going back to pilgrimage tattoos to the Holy Land, where, you know, people are, they're being tattooed with um, specific icons, right? Specific pattern blocks coming out of uh, Jerusalem. But, and this is going back into like the 1500s, right? But they are, they get to individually select what that pattern is. You know, they're still choosing what it is that they want to show. 
Whereas then, you know, when you look at, um, you know, some of the, the cultures and living cultures in um, Southeast Asia and into the Pacific, you know, you have these instances where tattoos are bestowed on individuals based on the number of human heads that they collected from their enemies in battle. And so each head gives you a very specific mark that then gives you this status within the community and gives you this sort of authority and, you know, even spiritual power within the community. And those are things that are not individually selected. They're achieved, but they're not, you know, the, the, the guy who earned that didn't say, well, you know, I really like, you know, the X instead of the circle for this head. No, like you got, you got what you got because of the head you took. Right. Right. <laughs> so this fella here that we see, this is a, uh, this is one of those Chinchoro mummies um, from South America that has this, these lines of tattooed dots on either side of his nose and, you know, it's been called a mustache. And this was an individual who um, was thought to actually be older than Utsi the Iceman. And back in 2016 or so, some, some colleagues and I wrote a paper where we ran this down and discovered that he was not, he was actually younger than Utsi, more recent than Utsi. Um, it, it, it's, it's really sort of the, uh, I don't know how the sausage is made with science, right? Basically there had been a, there had been a typo in a radiocarbon date that then got repeated and repeated and repeated. And mm -hmm. so it turns out this mummy that everybody was saying was older than Utsi was actually a couple thousand years younger. Well, and at least we have ways of, of gradually disentangling these things, uh, yeah. you know, making a, you know, a kind of a timeline. Yeah. I'd be curious, uh, Ginger, um, uh, since you've been building this timeline, um, other important things we might have missed talking about so far or, or questions that popped into your head so far? Uh, um, well, one thing that I wanted to ask you about, Aaron, are the two Russian mummies that are on your list of mummies on your chart that come right after, they come after Otzi and the Gabolene? They come after the male Gabolene mummy. mummy. Yeah. But when I went to find information on those, they go it, they go straight to the Pazirac and the Kurok. Are, are they even related? Is there any? They're not. <laughs> um, so you know this list you're talking about. So I maintain this this database um, that I have online that is you know the tattooed human mummy database. It's it's all of the examples of published identifications of tattooed human mummies that I can find um, from all over the earth and. Um, you know, we're actually, I'm getting ready to put out a new version of that probably in the next month or two. I put out a new version about every year as I find. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Uh, how, how do people find this database? Yeah. Um, so uh, if you Google me, um, I have on the academia.edu site, uh, I have a profile on there that has a lot of papers that I've written, including that database as free downloads. Um, I don't even think you have to sign up for it. But it's on, uh, like I said, on academia.edu. Um, if you search for my name, Aaron Dieterwolf, you can find find all of that. Um, okay, we'll try to find that link and post it along. Yeah, with this. I appreciate that. Um, that in but notes. so these two mummies that Ginger's asking about, these are um, they're earlier than the Pazirak, the famous you know chieftain and uh, Ukok princess or ice princess that most people have heard of, and. One thing I found in putting together this database is that there are a lot of identifications that, well, that aren't in English, right? That may be published in Russian or in Chinese. And so it's sort of harder to find them and they don't get as much uh, publicity online. Um, and so these are two sites. These are two different individuals, each one buried at a site sort of north east of the Black Sea, below the Volga. And these are really interesting examples because um, they're included in the database because they're identified as being tattoos, but both of these are examples where there's no preserved tissue. And so in one case, you have a leg bone that has this sort of sinuous, snaky looking line in carbon down the, uh, down the leg bone. And in the other one, there's a hand, the, the, the finger bones of the hand as they were found, you know, articulated, laid out in place in this tomb, also had what appeared to be carbon staining or designs on them. And so they've been identified as being tattooed. And, and what, what these folks have suggested is that, you know, either what well, we already mentioned, right, that the tattoos went so deep that they marked the bone, 
or B, that as the skin sloughed away, the carbon ink, the tattoo ink settled onto the bones, keeping its same design. And so when all the flesh was gone, those bones were still showing the tattoo marks. And, you know, I don't editorialize in the database. I'm just reporting it. Um, you know, as a scientist, I find that wildly implausible, right? Like, you know, as, as wet tissue dissolves, you know, my, my tattoos are not just going to settle onto my bones and whatever, you know, they're, they're going to, they're going to flow away or, or degrade with that tissue. Um, and I, you know, I, I've, I've sort of racked my head about this and talked with other people and I, I don't know how you run an experiment to test this, right? Like you, you've got to have tattooed skin over bones and put it in the appropriate, like dry, you know, mountainous conditions and then leave it for a couple thousand years and come back and see what happens. And so, so I don't know how we look at this with science to prove it or disprove it. Um, well, but that, that is, am I asking the, the markings they found on the bones, uh, yeah. do they actually achieve some depth into the bone or are they just surface stains? It, that is not reported. And, and that's the other problem, right? Is, you know, that we, a lot of times when people have talked about tattooing in academic literature, they've just sort of, sort of said, you know, the bones have marks on them. Well, you know, are the bone, are the bone surfaces disfigured and healed, which might mean that they were impacted by a tool, right? Um, right. You know, is, are the pigments soaked, as you said, soaked into the bones themselves? Are they just on the surface? Um, you know, might they have been, it, it seems much more plausible to me in these cases that the bodies were defleshed and then decorated. And that's yeah. something that we see in a lot of cultures around the world where, you know, skeletons are covered in red ochre that was applied after the, after the body was defleshed or, um, you know, skulls were painted or decorated or had plaster casts put on the face of them. And all that happened after the flesh was long gone. So I'm not sure why in this case, they believe them to be ta preserved tattoos, but mm -hmm. they've published them as such. And so that's why, that's why they're on the database. Oh, okay. I understand. Okay, so that, that's that's one of those things that definitely deserves a little asterisk next yeah, year. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ginger, were there any other items in there that had uh, stood out to you? Um, could you show us your tattoo that matches Otzi that you did? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's it's unremarkable. It's just you know, it's Otzi's wrist lines. Um, and was, was that done during an experiment that you it, did? Yeah, it was. So. Um, so this, that was done as part of those experiments looking at the microscopic wear patterns, right? Mm -hmm. Where over the process, over the course of that process, we had tested a number of tools, bones and, um, you know, cactus spines and things like this using pig skin. And, you know, pig skin is a forensic proxy for human skin, right? Sometimes if you'll, you know, if you'll watch those, those TV shows, right, they'll like, you know, shoot, shoot arrows or shoot uh, bullets at pigs because the, the pig the structure of pig skin and it's the depth of the epidermis is very similar to human skin. And so that's why forensic studies use it. So we had done this testing using pig skin, but then there was this, this other question, which was how do we, how do we know that tattooing pig skin and tattooing human skin will leave the same microscopic wear patterns, right? Because one is a dead animal and one is a live human. And so there are differences there. Um, and so you know, we, we needed to tattoo live human skin. And so in this case, I'm right-handed and my left wrist was available and I've been doing some research on Ootsie. And um, so I was like, well, you know, I can't really ask anybody to do something that I wouldn't do myself. And so that process then was, was doing the same marks on pig skin and then on me skin, and then comparing both the tattoos under the microscope, as well as then the tools that were used. And basically what it shows is that, yeah, it's, it's, it's a valid forensic proxy, right? Is that, that what we found by looking at pig skin carries through to looking at human skin as well. And for the differences that you've had it tattooed with the regular tattoo machine, as opposed to your experiment, was there any difference in the feeling? Um, well, you know, I, th I think probably, you know, a lot of your viewers probably, you know, people do stick and poke, right? And, you know, there are all different kinds of tattooing that happen all over the world, uh, different, you know, different settings, different shops. You know, you, you can go to international conferences and get, you know, different styles of tattoo put on that are non-machine non tattoos. And, um, right. 
you know, over the course of experimenting, you know, I've, I've acquired, it's one of those things where once you rip the bandaid off, it's sort of a, you know, it's going to happen. Right. And so I've got, you know, some cactus spine marks and some, some bone needle marks and some things like this. Um, you know, I have hand, uh, hand tap tattooing, um, that, uh, was done by, uh, Durga, who's now out of Berlin. Um, and you know, my experience, my personal anecdotal experience has been that those processes hurt less and heal faster than extensive machine tattoos. Okay. And, you know, I can't back that up scientifically. My, my intuition is that, you know, when you think of the number of hits per second that you get out of a machine versus the number of impacts to the skin with a single point tool or with even a, uh, you know, like a eight or a 10 that's a uh, eight or 10 round that's been put onto a hand tap tool and is hammered into you, right? There's just exponentially more impact to the skin from the machine. And so I think, you know, when you have people that do good work, the hand tattoos heal faster generally. But again, mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's what people tell me and that's my own experience. Right. Yeah, my experience with hand poke tattoos, you know, obviously there were those, you know, high school era hand poke <laughs> and those weren't being applied very smoothly. So it's like, yeah, yeah, right. But then later on, I had a friend who uh, apprenticed to learn the Japanese style of, of uh, hand tattooing and he did a bit of work on my foot. And uh, I always found it sort of, I don't want to say relaxing soothing but it's certainly more so than a machine tattoo even though yeah. this is a big needle group it was probably a you know a, a 27 or something like that that he was coloring my foot with but uh there was a rhythm there and so i think the same thing would go with these ancient tattooers the ones that had the experience that got really smooth about it they would probably be able to get you into a space where it wasn't that bad of an experience their apprentices on the other hand you know might, might be a little trickier <laughs> to sit for well, and, you know, I think that's something about the past in general that people oftentimes overlook. You know, people tend to think of like, you know, people in the past as these like cavemen caricatures, right? With like, you know, this giant spear that they're poking each other with to give each other tattoos. And, um, you know, when you look at, at like the preserved tattoos on mummies, you know, these, these are masterful. You know, these are incredible pieces of work. Um, they're done by experts. It's not just done by someone's buddy who happened to have a sharp cactus spine sitting around, right? <laughs> so the, pe the people that were giving these tattoos were important and revered members of their societies, we think, and probably also involved in um, healing practices, you know, whether they were midwives or shaman, uh, you know, traditional medicine, because all of that comes into this, you know, you're breaking the skin, you're letting blood. So you need to have the right person do this or, you know, things can go very, very wrong. Um, you know, bloodborne pathogens are a real thing. They're a real thing now, they were a real thing then. And so you need somebody who's watching out for those issues and can address them if they happen. So there would be some level of, of expertise. And what, what you're saying is, is, even though this was thousands of years ago, you still had your professionals in, in so well, to speak. Yeah, well, and like, so that, that image you just showed of, of uh, one of the Pazirac mummies with all of those fantastical animals tattooed on him, you know, it's not a stretch. I think everybody can sort of think of like the goal, you know, those, those same animals appear in uh, felt as images that are, that are woven into felt and as uh, hammered gold objects and carved wooden items from these same tombs. And I think, you know, anybody could look at like the wood or the gold and, and understand that, you know, those weren't made by some dude, they were made by an artisan, you know, somebody who knew their craft and was practicing it full time. And, you know, the same thing applies for the tattoos, right? They were, they were done by somebody who was possibly an artist in another medium as well, but was a professional, was a professional tattooist who knew what they were doing. Incredible to think about. So the example we were just looking at with those fantastic creatures, uh, how old is that example? Those go to the first couple of centuries BC. Um, so those are from the, uh, they're sometimes called the Scythian, uh, the, the, the specific culture is the Pazirac culture um, of the, the Altai regions, so that's sort of Siberia pushing into upper Mongolia and into Western China. And there are, I think, seven tattooed mummies from this culture at this point that have been discovered. And these are ones that were preserved in these, these giant log-lined tombs that were dug into the permafrost. 
Mm. And then over time, those tombs filled with water and they, they're, they're ice mummies basically is what's happening here. These very arid conditions where then water leaked into these two permafrost tombs and, and preserved everything. And so, yeah, there's, there's wood from these tombs, you know, there are wooden stools and horse bridles and all kinds of things. Um, and fortunately enough, tattoos. And those are actually another great example. Um, so there were these two, these two tombs at the Pazirac site. They were excavated, I think in the 1970s. And I believe only one of the mummies, one of the four mummies was seen to have tattoos at that point. And it wasn't until I think the late nineties maybe that they looked at the other three mummies using infrared and discovered that all, all four of them had these same style tattoos on them. So the, uh, the way that it disappears, but it is still visible under infrared. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, why that happens? Yeah. So um, infrared right interacts differently than natural light. So it reflects differently. And when you work in that infrared or near infrared spectrum, um, let's say you have a mummy that has tattoos, the skin may have darkened naturally because it's been exposed to desert conditions for 3000 years, right? Or it's been under the ice and all of the epidermis has disappeared. Well, when you shine infrared light on this, the infrared light pierces through or pushes through the preserved epidermis and then reflects in a different, in, in the infrared spectrum and using special um, infrared imaging uh, equipment, uh, collectors, for example, infrared collectors, um, you can see then those reflections. And this is, this is not new technology. Um, you probably heard about like underpainting, you know, finding these hidden paintings or hidden charcoal drawings <laughs> under old master paintings. It's exactly yep. the same process that's done with infrared. It's the same thing. It sees through the oil paints to the charcoal sketch that's made underneath. And since, since most ancient tattoo ink that we know of at this point is carbon based, the same principle applies. Okay, so even if the carbon has kind of reached a point where the, the color of the surface skin is, is hiding it, this will instantly see through it. Exactly, yeah. And my intuition is that, you know, it'll probably work in cases where there might be say body paint covering a tattoo. Um, you know, it may work in cases uh, using different imaging technologies, but I think it will work in cases where they may be covered over by uh, certain types of clothing as well, depending on the cloth and how, uh, how porous that is to infrared light. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things we can work through here. Um, you know, the problem is the technology is sort of being developed as we go. You know, there's not, there's not really a, like, a room full of tattooed mummies that we can go into with all of our equipment and sit down and like, test it all out and see what works and what doesn't work. I guess that's part of what makes the, the discovery so exciting is because yeah. you're having to piece it together from this scattered, you know, record. And, you know, some of these samples, I imagine there's still political reasons why you, you can't access them and that kind of thing. Depending on the location. Yeah. Um, you know, in some cases there, there are mummies that are, that are embargoed for cultural reasons. In some cases um, there are mummies that have been talked about being tattooed, but that have disappeared from the face of the earth. Um, you know, some of them may have been blown up during World War II, during, you know, bombing campaigns. Um, you know, so much, so much heritage was lost in different museums, particularly in Europe during that time. Um, some of them have just walked away. And, you know, over the centuries of museum curation, and it's, it's hard to sort of reconcile and go back and find all of those. Um, another story that, uh, you know, sort of related to that, um, we just posted about this recently on the, on the Instagram um, for the last year or so, I've been running this uh, archeology span Inc on the Instagram. And it's just kind of, you know, just sharing these kind of ideas and stories and information about, you know, historic and ancient tattooing and body modification. But we just recently posted about bog bodies, you know, the, the bodies that are preserved in the peat bogs of Northern Europe. And there was this one scholar, this one German scholar who had identified hundreds of tattooed bog bodies. And it turns out in re-looking at that information that it was all made up. Um, none of this was discovered until after he had died. But, you know, this was a case where this one scholar had said he had seen hundreds of these bodies. But then when other people went back and tried to find them, most of them didn't exist and could never be shown to have ever existed. And the ones that did exist weren't what he said they were. And so, you know, there's this kind of, this sort of had worked its way into the public consciousness as being, you know, bog bodies are tattooed. 
but mm. maybe not so much. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, the more sensational stories are the ones that circulate and often uh, long before you know, the real facts kind of clarify just because, yeah. oh, there's, a, there's an exciting story. This will sell ad space in our newspaper. And uh, yeah, before you know it, uh, it's been echoed around and uh, generally accepted. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it's definitely very exciting just to, to hear about the discoveries because, uh, you know, as, as much as we love and care about modern tattooing, uh, the, the history of it is fascinating. I think that, uh, you know, it tells us more about ourselves. And obviously that's the reason why we have the fields of archeology span and, and anthropology is uh, for some reason, we humans are very curious about ourselves. And may, maybe we're hoping to crack the code and figure out a way to stop making all the same mistakes if we study it far enough. But uh, it's, it's clear that tattooing is, is a universal thing that for some reason, we just, we're drawn to it, regardless of our culture, regardless of, you know, we don't need mass media to, to want tattoos. Do you have a personal theory about why humans are attracted to it? I mean, yes and no. Um, you know, that's one of the things of, you know, like when you get too far into the literature, you go to all these little rabbit holes. Um, and, you know, there, I think there are probably different reasons right? Like there is, you know, medicinal or therapeutic tattooing is a thing, even, even in the historic and probably the ancient past. Um, you know, on the other hand, then you have like the Pazirac mummies that have these fantastical um, designs on them that we can, you know, recognize and understand, you know, these are animals and they're, you know, they're not real animals, but they're imaginary, powerful animals. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with how, I mentioned this earlier, how we want to present ourselves in the world. Um, you know, there's this whole anthropological idea of signaling, right. Of like, you know, how do you show your value or your worth or what you aspire to be, um, to people that aren't related to you. And I think, you know, tattoos are, are, are a fantastic way to do that because they're going to stay with you for your entire life. And there's this process of earning them or acquiring them in the past that, um, is I think hard for us to wrap our heads around today in some ways, you know, the, the time commitment and the involvement and the social commitment in doing those things, um, taking heads to earn tattoos, for example. But yeah, I mean, for whatever the reason it is, it is a fundamental part of our human experience, right? In the same way that piercing our ears is, or, you know, wearing clothes, it, it's all part of, how we want to see our bodies or project or protect or involve our bodies in our daily lives. You know, can, can we prove any of that? Probably not. You know, it's good ideas. It's fun to talk about. Well, and for those of us who have tattoos, I think, you know, you're going to get some broad agreement about that. Right. <laughs> um, I, I do want to pipe in a little bit before we uh, wrap up because there's some questions from the chat room, if you don't yeah, mind. Please, by all means. Awesome. So uh, Sandy is writing in. She says, I read once that a lot of earlier archaeological findings were likely tattoo tools that were labeled as something else because of the stigma against tattoos. So then every time a tool that looked like that was found, they just kind of labeled it the same and then later realized uh, maybe those tools were actually used for tattooing. Um, do you have any experience or... Yeah, well, and so that's, that's actually, uh, that's one of the things that I write about a lot um, in my research, in my publications, is this, <laughs> this idea that, you know, there are a lot of things that could be used to tattoo, you know, from flint flakes to, you know, stone flakes to stone knives to uh, copper awls. And one of the things that we are struggling with today is both the bias against tattooing, but is also the fact that, you know, when people in the past have said an artifact was used to tattoo that's been based more on their own intuition rather than science, right? Rather than replicable data. And so that's part of the work that we're doing now is trying to set up these, these ways to actually definitively identify, you know, yes, this is a pointy object, but what was it really used for? And then we can, we can say with some confidence in some cases, although not by no means in all cases that these tools were used to tattoo. Awesome. 
Cool. Uh, some other uh, comments and questions here. Um, Lamar says, uh, this is cool. Uh, Nokomis Fairbanks says, uh, indigenous person here, and I'm a huge fan of your book, Drawing with Great Needles. Awesome. So happy to come across this live. Good deal. Yeah. yeah, Great Needles, it came out in uh, 2013. And it's, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's, it's a little overly academic. You know, it, it, it's, it is written as an academic volume. Um, and parts of it are hard to read, um, but it, it focuses specifically on uh, Native American traditions, both archaeologically and historically, um, in the east, sort of Great Plains moving into the eastern woodlands. And where can people find this book? Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Um, it's, uh, it's published by University of Texas Press, but I think it is probably available through many online real wow. retailers. Yeah, somebody found it. Uh, Karen Inkfield Crow says um, she just got the other book, uh, just ordered Ancient Ink, the Archaeology of Tattooing. Um, she also says so much history lost into the sands of time. She's talking about the, the gaps in history that are said. And, yeah, uh, and Ancient actually, Ink. So Ancient Ink came out in uh, what, 20, late 2017, early 2018. Um, and I co-edited that. Uh, Lars Krutak uh, was, the, was the first editor on that. I was second editor. Um, this is a project that Lars and I had been talking about for a couple of years of trying, again, to bring in, not, not to write it ourselves, right, but this idea of bringing in the archaeologists who had actually made these finds and getting them to write about their discoveries. And, you know, on one hand, that means you're getting the expert information. On the other hand, it means that, you know, it can be a little disjointed as a reader to, uh, to sort through. Um, but, yeah, we're real proud of that one. I think it's, you know, it's the first scholarly work on ancient tattooing that's out there. Cool. And then there's a lot of other people that were very excited to uh, come across this, either if they were scheduling it or if they just came across it at random. So uh, thank you very much from the internet. Hey, I appreciate it. And this will be, you know, of course, we always record these things and we'll uh, make it available for replay. We'll make sure that you've got a link to it. And uh, yeah, so this has really been uh, fascinating. And if, uh, if there's ever a reason to uh, uh, I think it would be interesting to get a panel of a, a number of experts at some point and uh, really get a, a, a conversation going. Well, and I really appreciate you guys having me again. I mean, you know, I feel like reaching out to the, ta the modern tattooing community is, is really important. And it's sort of why I started that Instagram, um, you know, because, you know, I'll sit around over beer and talk about this with my buddies who are, who are tattooers, you know, all day long, but um you know, there, there are a lot of people who this is, you know, this is their lives. They're, they're part of this community or this is their practice. And there's this history that I think is oftentimes hidden in, um, you know, behind paywalls and in university libraries and in places you can't get to. And so I think, um, you know, bridging that gap, you, we can both learn a lot. Um, I've been working with a, a fellow, Danny Ride, who's um, in New Zealand, looking at those Andean mummies. And Danny, who Danny's a tattooist, and his eye for what is happening at the microscopic level has just been fantastic. You know, he's able to look at these close-up images of these tattoos and identify where different techniques were used and see things that I would not have recognized at all. And so that's been a fantastic collaboration. And I'm, I'm hoping we can do a little bit more of that as we go yeah. on. Well, and uh, I guess I will interrupt uh, just one more time. I'm going to sh share my screen. In the, in the reinventing community, we, we have started an academia group for people that are interested in more geeky topics like this. And uh, let me show it off real quick before we go. This is our reinventing group. And if we scroll down to groups, public groups, and then we have academia. Are you going to bury and it at the bottom? Come on, man. <laughs> as, as soon as two more people sign up, we'll put it right up to the top. Okay. We, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, and right now it's academia and name only. It's a lot of us uh, tattoo geeks that are trying to attract academia. So uh, if uh, any yeah. of your professor friends, uh, anyways, okay, now I'll step in the background again. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Gabe. Uh, and uh, Ginger, is there any final comments here? You're working on the timeline. Uh, and the tattoo timeline is, is something that's part of our history section. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit more about uh, what you're doing there? Um, I'm just kind of going through. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to go from the very beginning to present day. And I'm trying to get the most updated 
factual information, like just to be informative, educational, not have a lot of stuff that's out there to mishmash with, you know what I mean? Because it's really, it's easy to run into brick walls or think you're on a line of information and then find out that it was nothing and you've just spent days or weeks or whatever and it's nothing. That's a, a lot of why I got a hold of the gears because I do have a science background so I know that research can end up in some dead end areas. So I was trying to avoid that. Don't, don't trust Wikipedia. No, ever, no. <laughs> And then, you know, of course, that's one of the challenges with this timeline is on the one hand, it would be cool to kind of make it a wiki and uh, you get a lot of contributors, but then we've got the same problem that happens uh, yeah. where it, it starts to, to lose some of its focus and you start getting opinions presented as facts, et cetera. Right. Well, we're, we're working on that. And, uh, you know, Ginger has been working on this, this uh, you know, ancient part of it. And uh, yeah, excited to see how that comes together. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't think of anything else right now. This has been an uh, amazing talk. Uh, I, I feel like, uh, you know, my head is brimming with stuff that, you know, I, I've not really heard before. I've, you know, everybody knows about Utsi, but this really takes us a lot deeper. So, uh, Aaron, again, thank you for coming on. And, uh, um, Aaron's got these two books that he's been involved in, which you can uh, find both of them on Amazon. And uh, Ginger, thank you for uh, making this happen and finding Aaron and inviting him. It's been a really terrific talk. Yeah. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank awesome. you for being so